Hi, this is Ian Anderson from Launch and Release. Today, I am here with Ter Naomi. We recently completed an Indiegogo campaign together. It was very successful. Hi, Tara. Hi, Ian. Um, so you are a singer-songwriter from Los Angeles, is that That's right? That's correct. And you recently did your Indiegogo campaign. How did that go? Um, it went really well, ultimately. I think it was uh, challenging in many ways that um, you'd prepared me for those, you know, the ways in which it would be challenging. And, you know, but actually being in the middle of it, I think, was was an experience I, you know, I, I'd never had such an intense um, fundraising experience before. So it was very up and down for me emotionally. And uh, but ultimately, I think it was really successful. Absolutely. I would say so. You had 569 backers for just over $50,000. You agreed to hop on Skype with me today so we could chat a little bit about your experience, which was pretty interesting. You had some assets in your circle of influence uh, that were pretty substantial, and we had some ideas about how we were going to promote the campaign that were rather creative uh so we agreed to do that and try it out and today we want to talk a little bit about that experience um before we do that let's set the table a little bit so everybody kind of understands um what you're bringing to the table as an artist and and what the backstory is so you started sing singing songwriting that's an awkward way to put it uh a while back and um, had success on YouTube. Why don't you give me a quick rundown of those early years and, and what happened early on that got you pushed into your career? Sure. Okay, so in 2006, I started putting videos on YouTube. This was after MySpace. In 2005, I had a little bit of following built up online um, after MySpace being featured on the front and just as an indie artist. Um, and so I'd been touring for a while in my car um, around the U.S., just kind of playing for like 20 to 50 people a night in different cities that, you know, people knew me from MySpace. And, um, and then YouTube came around, and I thought, okay, well, why don't I put these videos up on YouTube because touring in my car is getting too expensive and um, and it doesn't seem to be worth it to spend so much money and time to play for, you know, 20, 30, 40 people a night um, when I can reach potentially thousands. And so I put a series of videos up on YouTube over the summer in 2006 and I called it um, Virtual Summer Tour. And one of my songs, Say It's Possible, uh, really took off and got featured on the front page of YouTube and then, you know, got millions of views. and. Um, hundreds of people at the time now, I don't know the, the numbers at this point because people are still covering it, but at the time it was hundreds of people around the world um, were, were covering, making their own versions of it and posting on YouTube in multiple languages and that caught the attention of all the labels and publishers and industry because they were like, okay, this is an unknown artist playing, you know, posting original music and all these kids around the world are covering it and like, we don't even know who this is, what is going on here? Um, so first I signed a deal with Universal Music Publishing in the UK, and then that led to a deal with Island Records in the UK. And I released my first album over there, toured, um, and was there for about a year and a half. And then um, my the president of my label was my A&R guy. I was kind of like his pet project. He ended up leaving uh, to go run another record label, and so I left right after that because um, it's not a not a good thing to be um, an, a new artist at, an, un, at, a, at a major label without a champion. Yeah. So it, it sounds to me like you were kind of living the dream there for a little while. You started out, you were just on your own, touring out of your car, you went online, boom, sort of scored a pretty significant following, got signed. Yeah, we released, I released my first studio album with Island, with Universal Island, Island Records. Um, and, uh, and then, but I didn't really like it. And, um, I wrote a whole thing about that. Maybe you can link to that. Um, I wrote a large, a long piece about that in, for digital music news, Absolutely. um, several months ago. And so you did get to that point where, where you decided you were, you were in, you, you, uh, had the material for another album and you were ready to step back into the arena and decided to do a crowdfunding campaign to, uh, finance the recording of that. At this point, let's just um, kind of summarize some of the, I guess, what I would call assets that you had in your pocket for deploying your crowdfunding campaign. Let's talk about your circle of influence a little bit. Um, how Roughly how many emails did you have on your email list um, when we started this campaign? I think I started with about 7,500. You also had a pretty substantial... Um, 
kind of personal reach into into some influencers like sort of an invite only network of um influencers and artists and creatives a lot of tech people like you know the founder of indiegogo for example is you know in this network and i mean there are thousands of people it's not like it's a close intimate group but within that group are pretty much all like every founder of every tech company you know um a lot of artists a lot of um so there so there are um these these are people that a have a really big social reach right yep um, yep. you know, like very, a very direct social reach B they're very, um, socially inclined, technologically inclined, yes. dig, you know, sort of social media, digital marketing inclined. Um, so, so when we were visiting about these earlier in the campaign and stuff, you know, we were thinking this is a group of people. If there's a group of people that is going to engage in something like a crowdfunding campaign, um, this would be a group that's that's inclined to do so. Uh, there were some other people you met there um, who had some pretty direct ties to Indiegogo who we ultimately decided to do the campaign with. Now, so tell me about that a little bit. Um, well, you know, we were choosing, it's like, do, do we want to go with Pledge Music? Do we want to go with Kickstarter? Do we want, we want to go with Indiegogo? And we chose Indiegogo because... Well, my brother, for one, and then a very close friend of mine, they're they're both friends with the founder of Indiegogo. And so I thought, you know, wow, that would be great. And also, you know, I thought that would be helpful as far as maybe helping, you know, promote me or do something through Indiegogo. And then I also thought that because the founder is part of the network, that maybe my network of people would be more like more excited to back Indiegogo campaign. You know, I, I don't know. I just thought since it was sort of in the family, it would be a good idea to go with that company. Right. And so if you don't mind me name dropping, uh, one of the friends uh, worked on the Kite Patch Indiegogo, which right. had over 11,000 backers and over half a million dollars in funding. Mm -hmm. um, so not insignificant and a fair amount of other communities there. Right. Um, you, you had sort of that arm's length, interaction with the founder of Indiegogo, um, Slava, is that right? And yeah. um, you also had the opportunity to visit with some of the Indiegogo staff um, in their San Francisco office prior to the campaign, and we also interfaced with them during the campaign. So that's a pretty significant advantage that's probably not available to the average person, but something that you had going for you as we worked into launching the campaign. Um, now, one other thing that we need to talk about just to sort of set this table and then we'll get, get into some of the specifics of the campaign is you had a great big idea. Well, I had this idea pretty early on when I was thinking about, you know, making another album and it was sort of like, oh, I'm gonna make another album, who cares? <laughs> like, basically, like, I have all these friends, like the ones I just mentioned who are like changing the world and like, I'm making an album and I wish that I could do something that had a bigger reach and that had like more meaning that would excite me more than just recording another album. And, um, and then I, it, that led to sort of thinking about, Oh, well, I wish that I could like some do something charitable. I don't know. I was thinking, and I started thinking about all my like friends that I have that give so much money to charity and support charity. And I was like, well, I wish I could ask them to like, to like, let me use their money to support charity. And I'm like, well, I can't do that. But wait a minute. It was this very rapid fire thought process that then led me to have this realization of like, wow, what if I could get a bunch of these people, that I know who are big philanthropists to match whatever I make on Indiegogo for my album with a donation to charity. And my initial thought was get 10 guys, if I reach 100,000, get 10 guys who agree to match that 100,000 with a donation to charity, which would equal a million dollars going to charity. And the idea sounded amazing to me. It was a big idea. And, and though there are many crowdfunding campaigns that have a charitable element to it, I haven't seen one done on that scale. And 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 you were right on. I remember you saying this, you know, a million dollars is a big number. And when you're trying to get people to be interested in your campaign and you're trying to get your music to be newsworthy, you kind of have to have something to catch attention because there's plenty of musicians and plenty of music to, you know, there's a lot of noise to cut through out there. So that was your idea. And you, you um, basically took that idea and ran with it. Um, got some of that set up and that was one of the bigger elements of the campaign as far as promotional efforts. So 
Pretty, pretty big and interesting idea, not something you see in your average music campaign. Um, as we were getting set up to move into your campaign, you were interested in um, working on some PR and some efforts to, to try and get some spread and reach through social media with this idea. And you hired a PR firm um, tell me briefly about that and kind of what they what they said proposed what you did. Um, well, they were sort of like, well, we need something to promote. We need you to release a video or a single. And I'm kind of like, well, <laughs> I haven't recorded the album yet. You know, like that's the whole point. I don't have and I can't just like throw together a single to release, you know. Um, and so I ended up doing a video that was sort of like my original Say It's Possible video with people. Um, it was for my song, Help You Fly, but it was an acoustic version. So it wasn't like an actual release of a song. It was just like, here's an acoustic version. This is a sampling of what I'm doing. Here's a video. And I put that together pretty quickly um, so they could have something to show people. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, PR is a mystery to me. I hear so many things about PR. Most of what I hear about PR is it's a waste of money, to be honest. Like, that's what every, I mean, that's what most of the artists that I talk to have told me. Um, and I kind of needed to find out for myself <laughs> how that worked. So you spent $2,500 on PR at a firm where you personally knew the founder and owner and had a pretty good rapport with them, right? Mm -hmm. And just to sort of recap... Um, the first thing that, that they said, and, and this is right and, you know, concurrent with any advice you'd find on the internet, you don't just like flap a press release out there and get press. It needs to be notable and newsworthy if people are going to publish it. So in order to do that, they thought the million dollar idea was notable and newsworthy, but a little down the road. So, so we went towards a video trying to get some, um, social reach there, yeah. um, and, and that was the, that was what we did. So now at this point, we're getting into the campaign and, and we've covered a lot of stuff. Uh, you have a good size mailing list of, of over 7,000 people. You have some really good personal connections, including the founder of Indiegogo, lots of influencers, movers and shakers, high net worth people. Like you have access to a situation that would be most musicians dream. You are willing and bold enough to spend some of your own money on on PR to see what would happen. And this gets us to the beginning of the campaign, basically. How did it go during the first part of the campaign? Oh, I, th I just think it's funny because we're talking about all these like all these assets, and I know we're going to talk about this more more in depth. But it's like I feel like all of that did nothing, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> It was like, okay, so I had a couple emails with, with Indiegogo and they were like, basically told me everything we already knew. It was like, there was nothing that they were going to do for me, honestly. There was nothing. It was just sort of like, oh yeah, great. So, so happy that you're going to do it with us. And then it was just kind of like, okay, and, and your campaign looks great, you know, good luck. And I really felt like, I mean, I think I was in one newspaper, one, one newsletter and I saw maybe like. 10 extra pledges for like, maybe, I don't even know. It was hard to say what came from that. Maybe it, it was definitely less than 10, maybe even less than five. You know, right. it didn't really do anything. Um, so let's, I, let's back up for, for one second. Yeah. We're totally going to get into all that stuff. Okay. One thing I think that's important is we did launch and you did get some traction early. I mean, it's not oh, like yeah, you yeah. launched to total crickets chirping. No, 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 no. But that was all like what you said, which and, was like majority of, of everything is going to come from people you have a personal relationship with who are going to back you because they like you, you and, know? Yeah. And so to put that another way, that came from your efforts and your right. relationships. Um, right. That's what you were able to capitalize on. Um, right. And you did get some support from people, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna like build your re the resume of this campaign here real quickly. Um, Tara's campaign was featured in the Indiegogo newsletter uh, via email, um, and you've got some friends kind of who have some social reach and sent out tweets of your campaign to like a combined total of 1.7 million people. Um, right. That's a lot of people who your campaign was tweeted to. And yep. we watched pretty closely on those days and tried to correlate. And the results were maybe less than you had hoped. Is that fair to say? 
like zero. I mean, it was it was crazy. And I remember you had said that. But, and I mean, we had one friend of mine who um, who is a huge uh, writer director. Um, you in can Marvel. name names. It's OK. If- OK, so so James Gunn <laughs> tweeted um, my link out and he's like, are you as big a fan of Tara Naomi as I am? And it was awesome that he did that. And like it resulted in nothing. And then Margaret Cho tweeted something about, you know, Tara Naomi's a genius, you know, and like gave a link and and nothing like not one. There was like not one, you know, and I know this because I think on those days I didn't do a ton of promotion, like nothing came in. I mean, maybe if something came in, you know, later on down the road or whatever but like most of the people that pledged were either you know people on my mailing list people on my facebook um my you know my my uh facebook page my my professional page um you know people that wrote to me like a lot of people wrote to me after they pledged and they were like oh we've been fans we've been following you since whenever and so i was i we had a pretty good sense of where all these people were coming from and it really felt like i mean i thought you know god if it goes if the link goes out to goes out to a million people there's gonna at least be like you know 50 or so that come in that and it was just like like zero it was amazing i couldn't believe it yeah the math is astonishing Uh, yeah it's very consistent with what i've seen i mean i've had other projects that spike lee tweeted to like a couple million people and get you get two followers i mean you know so one out of a million people basically yeah but i mean you know that was that was worth worth the effort and and we saw what happened from that I, I think it demonstrates the reality of what trying to get other people to share your music gives you in return and while it might be a little bit of quote unquote exposure it's not very much in terms of quantifiable results whether measured in dollars backers or even sales of your CD or people on your email list. I mean, it's, it just doesn't amount to much. Now let's circle back real quick. So again, you spent $2,500 on your PR efforts um, with that company. And I had talked to them too to get a sense. And basically, boy, they launched your press release out there that was pretty well built on the idea of A, your new video, which you got some a fair number of views on and B, your million dollar charity donation, which is not insignificant. Um, I think they blasted it out to a hundred, hundred or more different places they said and, and followed up with them. And ultimately we know what came of that. You, you basically got placement in two blogs. Um, right. Tell, tell me about what you got there and then how that turned out. Well, I mean, one of them was my friend Ari who has been a friend and supporter for years and, you know, published another piece that I'd written in digital music news. So, I mean, I, you know, I think that would have happened regardless of the PR, um, because he was, you know, I'd already talked to him about it. We'd already been talking about doing something with digital music news, you know, around my campaign. So, and then the other was like a small blog, um, with maybe a readership of like 14,000 people or something, you know, and that was nice. But, uh, I think, I think maybe one, we well, and you, you had two placements other than Ari. You had Elmore Magazine and then Hello Giggles, right? Oh, right, right. I totally forgot about it. Yeah, the Hello Giggles thing was pretty big, and that also came from a friend of mine. Um, so the biggest things just came from people that I already knew. Um, yeah. And But ultimately, I don't even think any it resulted in any traffic. I think maybe one or two people found me from those combined. You know, a couple No, a couple people found me through Digital Music News. That's not true. Definitely a couple of people were like, I saw you in Ari's article and I read about you. So that was the most, I think the most beneficial was digital music news. Um, and the other two, I don't know if it really did anything aside from generate a cool piece of press for me. Yeah. So interesting. I mean, here we are, and, and this might be sounding um, a little bit Debbie Downer, but we just cataloged a whole boatload of things that really we did right. I mean, you did right. Like you did as well as you could and you got some results in terms of getting your campaign out there and getting yourself in front of some people. And basically what we found was that it didn't amount to a whole lot. Right. And that's, that's good experience to have in your pocket. I mean, that's one of the reasons we're talking about this today is to share that with people Um, because a lot of artists, if they choose to focus their efforts on getting attention through 
other means, they don't see a lot of results. And the problem there is if you forget to focus on the relationships that you have, you're just not going to get very far. Let's pivot here and let's talk about, let me ask you, what do you think like the top two or three most important elements of your campaign were that did lead to your success? Because ultimately you still raised 50 grand and have right. some money to record an album. So what were those top two or three things in your opinion? Well, I feel like, like what you just said, it sounds like kind of a downer. And I think like, we're talking about the stuff that, that didn't work, but the, the really positive thing I think that we can take away, especially for everybody reading this, who's about to do their campaign. Like if we'd found out that, you know, if I, if, if, if all that, you know, famous people tweeting and like PR and exposure on the web, like, and, and starting with a huge fan, you know, all these things, if, if all that worked, then I feel like it'd be really easy for somebody who doesn't have that to be like, Oh, well, of course she raised that money. You know, I, I can't do that. I don't have, you know, I don't have famous friends or I don't have, you know, and the, I think the good news is that the stuff that looked like an advantage didn't actually really produce any results. So I feel like what that means is that anybody can have success crowdfunding if you do it right, you know, and if you, and it doesn't matter. Like the thing that we found out is it really doesn't matter. Like if you have people with a million followers promoting you and if you know the head of whatever, and if you have like PR, it's like, those weren't the things that worked. So I think it's actually a really positive takeaway for anybody watching this because it just means that that you don't need that stuff. And not only don't you need it, but it's a distraction because the stuff that actually really worked for me was everything that you coached me and, you know, told me to do, which was the direct outreach to my friends and extended network. And so direct outreach was really key. Were there any particular modalities of direct outreach, any things you said or wrote or did that you felt like were super effective um, compared to others? Or was it just generally keeping at it and just sort of doing the same thing over and over? Um, it's hard to say. I mean, I, I, if I could do it again, I think I would have maybe had more sort of free content that I would have like given away on, on a regular basis to kind of, um, get people just attract more attention, I guess. I did a lot of just writing to people and, um, and emailing and calling and texting. And I mean, I think that was good for my personal network. I, we didn't really see any big spikes when I did one thing versus another thing. We saw a pretty consistent, like, you know, climb. That's what I would say is that generally your, your total funding and total number of backers was a function of the amount of outreach you've done. And, right. but that being said, some of the keys to the outreach you did was that you weren't a broken record. I mean, while you, right. while you did, hold up your purpose and while you did have to continually communicate your plan, you did not just plaster your pages with your campaign link and say, please back me over no. and over no. and over and over. No. Every time you did communicate, there was a slightly new twist on it. And, and sometimes you really laid yourself out there um, emotionally or, or describing to people where you were at in the process. So yeah, that was... Yeah probably a pretty big part of getting people to continually access your communications and not just like block it out like oh there's Tara again right and I think some people probably did that <laughs> it was very clarifying it really like and it made me a much better communicator it made me like much more direct and unafraid to like ask for what I want so I mean I mean it was it was hard reaching out to all those people but I feel like ultimately it, it was on a personal level and a business level it was really 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 helpful and it's something that we're not good at I mean, I know all these business people, they'll sit down and have a conversation and ask someone for millions of dollars over coffee, you know? <laughs> and and I'm like, how do you do that? You know, and it's because they believe in themselves. They believe in their idea. And if they don't, then they just believe in their ability to get what they want, you know? And so several times I had to, I do this all the time. I think like I, my brother's a businessman and I'll just be like, what would my brother do? Like, what would, how would he reach out about this? How would he handle this? Because I feel like business people, it's a different personality type and tech and, and typically they're just so much more able to ask for what they want, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. And that's yeah. part of the big setup process that we go through in building the campaign is getting you to where you know what you want and you know why you want it, which makes, gives you that footing to start the direct outreach. Yeah, totally. Cool. Totally.
I have this habit of putting words in other people's mouths. So. No, I mean, it's absolutely true. No, you made me clarify and clarify and clarify and like whittle down the clarifications and get so crystal clear in for myself why I was doing it and what the purpose was and, you know, the intention behind it. And I think it was really amazing because if I hadn't worked with you, I would have probably been like, I'm making a new album. It's going to be my best album yet. And I would have done that that. And really, you know, you were the first thing you said. One of the first things was like, you know what? People really don't don't care that much about the music. I mean, they do in the sense that they're excited about it, whatever. But they really just want to hear. They're really going to get inspired by what they feel, you know, by the personal how they feel about you personally and what you want to do and backing that, you know, like, what is your purpose? Like if you're, if you're clear in your convict in, in, in your intentions behind doing this, that's what they're going to feel. They're not going to really saying I'm going to make the best album ever that I've ever, you know, that's not going to inspire people. And I think that was really such a, such a shift for me and probably a big part of the reason that this campaign was so much more almost twice as successful as my pledge campaign in 2010, which in some ways I was much more active at that time. Uh, you know, I had been, it was much closer to the time that I had, you know, that the YouTube stuff had happened, that, um, it was only a couple years after Island Records. And right. so in many ways I was still like, when I posted a video on YouTube at that time, I would get like maybe 20,000, 30,000 views. And now when I do it, I get like a fraction of that because I haven't been as active. So it's like my fan base was less engaged than it was in 2010, but my campaign was twice as successful. And I know that's because in 2010, when I posted, when I launched that Pledge Music campaign, I put a video up of me like sitting in, you know, my living room or whatever. And I was like, you guys, I'm going to make an album and I'm going to do it with Pledge Music and part of the money's going to go to charity. And like, I mean, it was just so uninspiring. And, um, and then I didn't reach out to anybody I knew. I just counted on like fan base. I did what I did differently that I think what did work in that campaign was I had a content release schedule that it was very active. It was like three times a day on all different social media, releasing different things, releasing unreleased tracks and demos. And, you know, I was so proactive and like so uh, focused in the marketing. Um, but it's, it's just it's just so interesting because what I didn't do in that one, I didn't reach out to a single like I posted once on Facebook, I posted like, I sent out an email, like one email, maybe two emails, like one at the beginning and one at the end, I think being like friends, you know, other than that, the only people, the only friends I think who pledged on my 2010 crowdfunded album were like my parents. Um, I don't even think any of my extended family pledged like a couple of my parents' friends. And then I don't even think any of my friends did it because I was so nervous and uncomfortable asking my friends to support me. Yeah. So I really just didn't. And I kind of counted on people maybe coming across it on Facebook and being like, oh, Tara's doing an album. I'll back that, which of course didn't happen. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, the, the reaching out to people, it just shows you. It's like I, I this, this campaign was twice as successful as the last one. Thank you for your time here today and sharing everything with everybody. I will put some of those links up and uh, we will keep an eye on what you're doing. Yeah, and I just want to say, like, listen to Ian. <laughs> if you want to know how to do this, I mean, because I've had this, this experience now twice, one time, you know, one time not working with Ian, one time working with Ian. And, I mean, like, your insights on everything were invaluable. So, and, and I mean, I know that I wouldn't have, I, I would have had no, I would have run this campaign completely differently and much less successfully without, you know, following the principles that you've laid out. And I think it's such an incredible resource for people that they can go on to your website and download your course and really be guided through everything that, you know, that they need to do to have a more successful campaign. So, well, thank, thank you. you. And I definitely want to say I did not pay Tara to say that. Uh, she, <laughs> actually, she actually paid me. So I appreciate, <laughs> appreciate that a lot. Uh, it, it was it was just really fun for you to be the guinea pig and try some of those great ideas. They were good ideas. Um, and now we have a little better idea of kind of what comes out of the sausage grinder. Yeah, yeah. well, thank you, Tara. And um, we'll let you go for now. Okay, thanks, Ian. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye.